Okay, I've got a question. What do a Christmas musical, a restaurant for Broadway up-and-comers, and a small-town ingenue with a heart of gold have in common? Well, that you use the word ingenue. Somehow, believe it or not, they are all key pop points in 2024's A Carol for Two. So we've got a lot to talk about, Josh. Or maybe sing about, Jennifer, and we will unwrap it all on this episode of Do You Watch What I Watch. Sit down and watch, then have a talk with Jennifer and Josh. Well, this one asks some big questions, namely, who knew? Who knew it'd be you? Who knew it'd be you at Christmas? We'll tell you all about that a little bit later. We'll take the deep dive on the plot on this A Carol for Two, brand new out on Hallmark Channel, and give you our bottom line hot takes a bit later in our Gold or Coal segment. Stay tuned for that. That's right. So here's the plot summary. A talented singer starts working at a Broadway restaurant with singing waiters. Curtain up and podcast favorite here, Jenna Claire Mason. She is giving us a triumphant small town version of Joy to the World. It is a community send off of sorts. Her name is Violet and she's off to big Broadway, ready to go. And now we are in the big city, New York City, and our male lead, Jordan Litz, his name is Alex is belting out his own version of Joy to the World at a spot called Fiori's. Now, Fiori's is jazzy, and it's one of these kind of restaurants where the wait staff also sings, and they interact with the customers in a real kind of kitschy sort of way. The crowd loves this place. He is a singing waiter, and his cousin Brad has an outstanding tab at the restaurant, and if he doesn't pay, turns out Alex may not get a good slot in the big Christmas Eve show and won't get discovered, and his dreams will be dashed. So we get from Go that Alex has a a, a, a scotia of anxiety, Jennifer. Probably so, and I think his relationship with cousin Brad is a little um, strained at times. Brad is like the cousin you love to hate, right, or... And really the character in this movie you love to hate. He's lovable, but he's a little much if you're around him too much. So yeah, yeah they've they've got some strife there. <laughs> well, things, speaking of strife, take a bit of a sad turn for Vi. So the show that she's going to New York to be in is a bust. Funding gets pulled, so it's not happening, and she needs a place to stay in New York City. So she's off to this jazzy restaurant, Fiori's, and it turns out the owner, Hazel, was besties with Vi's Aunt Carol. So they swap some stories, they catch up. Hazel gives her a shot as a singing waitress and connects her with May, who just so happens to need a roommate. So all of this is very fortuitous for Vi out at the gate. Now, Alex is not so nice to Vi when Hazel introduces her backstage. She gets to sing the next night, and Alex suggests it's nepotism, which I'm like, She's not really related to Hazel. She's just kind of like a friend of a friend kind of situation. But Favoritism, at least. Exactly, yes. To smooth it all over, however, she convinces him to help her out. And if so, Hazel will give him the coveted prime slot in the big Christmas Eve show. So apparently there's this legend at Fiori's that big Broadway producers show up on Christmas Eve and the people who performed the big number at the end of it wind up on Broadway. It's happened a couple of times. Can I just say, Jennifer, I would absolutely go to this kind of a place in New York City. It looked like yeah. it was a good meal, and it looked like it was good entertainment. It was giving me all of that New York City vibe. It looked very vibey, very fun. And I am not a big Broadway baby. I've seen Wicked when it came to Nashville. And I saw The Grinch on Broadway when I went to New York one year, so... That's the extent. And I've seen a couple others like on TV, but I'm not in the Broadway circle, but I appreciate it. And I like to think there is a place kind of like this. I think it is. I think it's inspired. It's not that name, but I think it's kind of inspired by real places. Are you a Broadway connoisseur, Josh? Not necessarily a connoisseur. My mom was a huge Broadway fan. In fact, I have a lot of all of her vinyl soundtracks from from Broadway shows. And I've seen a couple shows on Broadway. I think In the Heights was one of my favorites that I saw Lynn Manuel Man- Moran- Lynn Manuel Miranda wrote that one exactly. Easy for me to say, except not at all. But you know, I think that there's something magical about Broadway, especially when it is 
the story of people trying to make it, you know, and, and be discovered and be seen. And that's what we get throughout this movie, which I thought brought a lot of heart to it throughout. Anyway, when it's Vi's big shot on stage, she slays Oh Holy Night, Alex, Brad, and everyone at the restaurant. They're all pretty stunned about her abilities. Alex, however, still thinks she's a little bit entitled and says he, quote, knows her type. Hazel hatches a plan to have Alex and Vi close the big Christmas Eve show now. In the meantime, Brad, you know, Alex's cousin, has hatched his own plan. He is calling it Operation Chick Magnet and... gross (laughs) come on i really thought when alex and vi were paired together for the final number i thought alex was going to be a lot more irritated at that that the new girl he had to share the spotlight with the new girl but it didn't seem to bother him yeah i think he appreciated that she actually had a great voice you know and that Mm -hmm. she did have potential May, again her roommate and vi stroll through a holiday market when her dad calls she lies again. Here we go. Not telling the truth. So many Communication gaff. Yes, about the status of her show because she's embarrassed about it. Alex is working on a new song because he really wants to be a songwriter on Broadway, not necessarily a performer. And Brad is being Brad and interrupting the creative process for him. It's meant to be funny, I think, but it reads for me more as annoying than anything. I really throughout just couldn't get into this brad subplot unfortunately not a big brad fan not a brad (laughs) well did you notice that Vi's roommate may is that her name Uh she was one of the three leading ladies in the um santa summit oh santa summit thank you yeah yeah i did so glad to see her back because she sang in that movie and i was like is that the same person that was it is yeah and she's great i thought she did a really nice job in this role too Anyway, Alex and Vi connect after hours about her dash dreams on Broadway and the possibilities for their whiz-bang closing number. He poo-poos White Christmas. She poo-poos Frosty the Snowman. So clearly this is going to be a problem for them. Meantime, Brad runs into his ex, Chanel, on the street. Her name is, as I said, Chanel, just like the fancy person. He tells a lie to her and says that Vi is his girlfriend. Ugh. Here we go. Thing to do. Barely. Like that's your go-to. That means you've been creepy in other ways in your life, Brad. Yeah, Brad. That's yeah. your default is just to lie in a creepy way. I don't like it. Yeah, and clearly Vi is not so interested in Brad, but she's trying to be, you know, that small town, small town kindness thing. She's just trying to, you know, be cordial. That's the way she's she's acting toward him is cordial. Alex and Vi go off to the holiday market in town to stuff baskets for Broadway, which, you know, was kind of fun. He lets on that he wishes he could spend more time writing, so I'm calling it right now. They are going to collaborate on some big brand new holiday ballad for the big Christmas Eve shindig. It is clear what they are setting up here. They can't agree on a traditional Christmas song, so I'm betting that they're going to wind up doing an original song that probably he wrote. Stay tuned. Which there are only about 8 trillion Christmas songs floating around in the ether already. We couldn't have settled on one. And why was Frosty even in the conversation? No. No. Come on. Come on. Anyway. Might as well be like, I want to hit the pot of us for Christmas or oh. want for Christmas in the two front teeth. No. No. It shouldn't have even been in the conversation. No. Brad fumbles his way through an awkward phone call with Vi. They set up a date, but Brad bones it and says that June, a neighbor friend, is Alex's girlfriend. Mm. More lies here. Alex isn't so excited to go along with this little white lie, but here we go nonetheless. Vi continues to lie to her father about the status of the show, and before we know it, we are off to the Festival of Trees in New York City. Brad doesn't care about the charity angle of the event, He just wants to snuggle up to Vi. He is officially a doof in my book, and I officially do not like him. Brad, then we get this whole like Cyrano de Bergerac kind of thing. Like Brad is talking to Vi, but she's like, "So, what's your favorite Broadway play and a musical?" And he like runs back to Alex and is like, "What's the best one and why?" So he's kind of going back and forth. All the while, we see June's tree had hand blown glass ornaments. Just like Heidi Heidelberg in a Heidelberg holiday. Yeah. More of that, please. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So 
Vi and Alex then drop off some baskets to some Broadway vets in what is probably my favorite scene in this entire movie. Mm -hmm. I yeah. loved this scene. They are smitten over the youngins in their midst, and they suggest that they are a cute couple and ask them to sing together. And what we get, dear listener, is the most perfect duet of chestnuts roasting on an open fire that I have literally ever heard in my entire life. And I officially want to add this somehow to my Spotify playlist. It is just, I thought, that freaking good. And I like that we didn't just get like a little couple lines. We got the I mean, we got a whole song. song. Yeah. Yeah. And all the while, all the retirees are just looking on. It wasn't just the actors. It was also like showrunners or backstage workers from Broadway. And I love the idea that they still have this community even in their later years. And they're all still friends. And that just shows you how strong the Broadway bond is all the while. They're singing and connecting. It was my favorite scene as well. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Loved it, start to finish. Vi has a bust of an audition, and afterwards she and Alex stroll some near some exceedingly fake snow ahem, ahem, mm, and unpack her fear of failure and disappointing her dad. He lets on about his Christmas musical that he's been working on, being rejected dozens of times, and it's becoming clear that he's beginning to catch the feels for her at this point. So much so, he buys her a Yule Log, which apparently is something that's very much emblematic of the season for her. More power... Like a big old Swiss cake roll is what it looked like. Exactly. Which yeah. Brad, subsequently... God, Brad. Pretends that he bought when Vi shows up. I am mad, especially in the next scene when Brad happens to fall asleep during the performance of the Nutcracker that he decided to buy tickets for her for brad you're mad at brad i'm and you are a dad at, i'm a dad who's mad at brad <laughs> vi and alex have a moment when he sings a few bars from a song from his christmas show then vi's roommate happens to book chicago hey oh that's great for may but vi is feeling some sort of way about it kind of a mix of like jealousy and a little bit of anger, maybe a little bit of sadness, conflicted that she's still lying to her dad about her lack of success on Broadway. Ugh. The lies. Come a on. A lot. So let's remember, Vi had been in New York for approximately like two weeks at this point. Like, why are we acting like she'd been here for years really pounding the pavement? For all yeah. Shows? Yeah. No, she yeah. hasn't been. Yeah. Give it some time, yeah. girl. Yeah. It'll be all right. Yeah, there is a rehearsal of Vi and Alex's big song, and it's clear things are heating up between the two of them, especially when they pledge to support one another. So they really start connecting on a heart level about their dreams and their visions for their lives. All right, so the girls decided that they were going to host a big party for all the folks who work at Fiore's on the 23rd, so the night before Christmas Eve. And so we're at that big party, and Alex and May are there, so is Brad, and Brad happens to record scratch the whole party when he suggests they all go caroling because he heard from Alex that she really wanted to go caroling, and that's also something that she's into. So basically what's happening here is Alex is learning all this stuff about our dear lead here and passing that information on to Brad to kind of tee it up for him to have this relationship. I don't like it. Alex is bummed and slightly grossed out when he sees Vi and Brad kiss underneath the mistletoe. And in response, Brad looks on as Alex busts out an acapella version of Silent Night, you know, as one does. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's what I was like. Oh, yeah, we're going full musical. <laughs> because... This is full tilt musicale. Yeah. yeah. Vi and Alex rehearse their big number. It's cutely awkward because they're trying to figure out the staging of it. Brad sends flowers for Vi's big night, but she suddenly has decided that she is not quite feeling things with Brad and calls to break up with him, <laughs> like, really quickly. <laughs> well, I think she was kind of connecting more with Alex the whole time. It was and clear. And Alex finally says, hey, June and I broke up, even though they were never together to begin with, the friend. And so I think she saw that as like a, oh, well. Like a gesture. Is open. Yes, yeah. It is the night of the big performance, and of course, her dad shows up just out of nowhere. Vi is worried that he will think less of her. And I'm like, you're still singing in New York City, and clearly your dad loves you. Stop it. Yeah. 
He was precious. He's a little precious move. What Very are you precious. To do? Alex tells her to step outside because Vi's basically having a panic attack here. So Alex like, hey, go outside, catch your breath, take a few breaths, whatever. And so she goes out, she leaves, and she walks around the corner. But yikes, here comes Brad storming into the place because he is like mad and wants to find her the whole nine yards. And so Alex sees him and scoots him outside, and we get this scene where they basically unpack all of their shenanigans where they've lied about everything, and he was giving her, he was giving him information about her. She overhears it all, and this is officially the oopsie doodle. And the stakes are high because the show must go on, right? It's time for them to sing. That's what they say, that the show must go on. The show must go on, except it doesn't. So they get up on stage, she starts to sing, she gets two words out, and then she glances and sees him, and suddenly she freezes. She can't do it anymore. She storms off the stage into the night, and Alex and her dad chase after her and track her down in the kitchen. Now, dad and daughter have, like, one of the best heart-to-heart conversations that I've seen between a dad and a daughter in one of these things, like... I don't know who this guy is that they got to play her dad, but I 1,000% believed that he was her dad in this moment, just the way that he He's said it. He's been in a lot of these movies. Oh. He's so good. He seems so genuine. Yeah. So genuine, so tender, and just it was really well written. I just thought it was a great scene. Alex and Brad, meantime, the next morning, have their own heart-to-heart, and they make nice. So the Christmas Eve performance was a super bust, just so you know. But it's Christmas. And do you believe in a Christmas miracle, Jennifer? Always. Here we go. So Vi and her dad have Yule logs in matching jammies, and they're having a good time on Christmas. There's a knock at the door, and then this note is just slipped under the the crack underneath the door, and it says, Fiori's, 5 p.m., be there. Okay, what's this about? Anyway, it turns out Marty the big Broadway hotshot who shows up on Christmas Eve to scout talent is there at Fiori's at 5 p.m. Alex told Hazel everything about what they had been up to and what they had done. Alex apologizes. They reaffirm their support for each other, and they belt out a hit ballad from his Christmas musical. And that's the lyric that I gave you a little bit early. Who knew? Who knew it'd be you? Who knew it'd be you at Christmas? We've been singing that around our house all day today. Molly yes, really it likes is it. An earworm. It's yes. an earworm. It's a great song. And again, I'm like, come on, Hallmark. Could you put this soundtrack on Spotify, please? Please. It is such a Broadway belter, too. Like, it just had that razzmatazz that I have to believe, you know, true Broadway songwriters put it together because it, it was elevated for sure. Anyway, the song is a huge smash. Everyone in the room. It's it's Hazel, the Broadway producer, and her dad. And they're just like gaga in love with the whole thing. They wind up on Broadway. We get like a 12-second epilogue, which is just like <laughs> them on the Broadway it stage. Like AI generated, like the headline. Yeah, it's really yeah. crazy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's a smash. They wind up on Broadway. And of course, they wind up in Lerve. It's time for It is time for our gold or coal segment where we each give three gifts. If there's more gold, it's a smash. And if there's more coal, it's a Broadway bust. Josh, I'm coming to you first. What gifts are you bringing to the table? Oh, gold. Out of the gate for me for the leads here. I just thought these two together were great. She is... You know, I am a big fan of hers. She was in A Holiday Spectacular where she was a rockette. She did Heidelberg Holiday, and this year she's back in New York City. And I think this is the right kind of role for her because she's actually been on Broadway. So it's, like, super believable that she's doing this kind of a thing. And I think that he complimented her really well. I mean, he's a Broadway star in his own right. And the two of them together, it was just perfect casting believable romance i i bought it and i was here for it and i love that they're both broadway stars they've both been in wicked amongst you know other things too i mean they just could not have been more perfectly cast i agree so i will give gold like you alluded to earlier 
I want the soundtrack. I would actually add this to my playlists. I would listen to it all the time. It was so well done and so well put together. And just so beautiful that it gave me the warm and fuzzy. So gold. Yeah. The music in this was surprising because a lot of times the music can be an afterthought in these. Just something we tack on. And it was really central to this. And you could tell that they put some thought in it to make sure it was really done well. So I agree. Which I wanted that going into this. I was hopeful yes. that's what we would get. But I was yes. uh, pessimistic and pleasantly surprised. So. Yeah. Some coal for me. I did not need this Brad subplot at all. I just thought it's it was a big part of the movie. Yeah, it, and that's my problem. Like it hung too much on Brad. Like I get it. We needed something that was like the hurdle for them to get over. I just think that it was too much, Brad. It was too much of him being a doof, and I don't know. For me, it just it felt like two or three too many scenes involving Brad and him trying to win her over and being a little slimy about it hmm. well i'm gonna give some gold i like the brad character i like that he was so extra like don't just give it halfway if we're gonna do it let's go full brad give me all the humor and the physical comedy this movie was written by nina weinman who wrote catch me if you claws never kiss a man in a christmas sweater pumpkin pie wars that you loved so much so i like that she brought that humor into this story and I thought he was a hoot, so give me more. He's annoying, but he's supposed to be, so. Mm. There you go. Gold for me, I loved that dad and daughter scene. I just thought that it was so heartfelt, so well written, and just so true. And the way that they shot that, too, was interesting because they really wanted you to see her in that moment being really upset and so she was literally like <laughs> one third of your screen just her face crying and the way that they framed it and i don't know i just thought it was really a poignant scene and they did a great job with it well and i think she had the right to be that upset too yeah i mean if you find out the guy you were dating was lying to you and the guy that you want to be dating now was also lying to you that's a that's a double punch. So sometimes when they freak out, they're like, oh, I just can't. I'm like, okay, suck it up. But I would be upset too. So that was justified. Um, my last gift is a piece of gold. That's three for me. And it's what I said out loud to myself with no one else in the room. I said, that's what Christmas movies should be mm. when it was over. I was just so happy when it was over. My heart was warm. It gave me everything I wanted. And I immediately wanted to tell other people, you should watch this movie. This movie is so good. So to me, that means something, and that is gold. This is my, yeah, it's my favorite of the season. Oh, I love to hear that. I'm going to say it too. It's one of, it's one of, if not my favorite of the season so far too. I can't think of Were one. Were they Christmas the charade? Because you gave three for three on Christmas charade. I did. I would say that I enjoyed this more than Christmas charade though. Yeah. Absolutely. I would totally watch this again every year. Absolutely. I would 1000% watch this again. And you know what I really liked about this, Jennifer? I love that they so often they yada yada the finishes, you know, where we're just trying to wrap it up and put a bow on it. I felt like the way that this ended was so well paced and so thoughtful. And and we really got these kind of winks and a nod. Did you catch the little wink and a nod between Hazel and her dad where she said, Hey, do you want to see my third Tony? So it was sort of like this wink that oh, yeah. maybe, maybe <laughs> romance would brew between the two of them. Like I just Oh, you think so? Oh, I absolutely think so. I thought yeah. she was just trying to get her get her get him out of there just so that um the leads could do their thing. But I just I kinda I picked up on a little vibe between the two of them. But I just love how there was so much heart in this one, especially the way it ended. And and you're absolutely right. It was 1,000% what you want a Christmas movie to be. And I would 1 million percent <laughs> watch it again. We asked for your opinions and we got some comments. So I'm going to read those now. First up from our dear listener, Marissa. I liked them both for different reasons. Oh, because she was talking about My Sweet Austrian Holiday that we already talked about this week and a Carol for two. But she said... But Carol for Two takes the Christmas cake for the singing talent alone. We agree. And then Leslie Ann said, A Carol for Two was darling. Jenna Claire is always a delight, and the songs and voices were great. I think you have another one, Josh, that you want to share? I do, because I watched this one with my eight-year-old Molly, who just said she didn't like the fake mistletoe, and she wanted that to be known. <laughs> <laughs> and 
now we know where she stands. And now we know where she stands. And that, friends, is another episode of Do You Watch What I Watch. Special thanks, as always, to our good friend Nick Schwarz for our amazing theme song. And to each and every one of you for taking the time to listen on your favorite podcast platform or watch us on YouTube. We really do appreciate you. That's right. And if it's not too much trouble, if you find yourself with a few extra moments, if you could leave us a five-star rating review, we love those this time of year. Tell a friend if they're watching Christmas movies, be like, hey, have you heard about this podcast? Do you watch what I watch with Jennifer and Josh? We appreciate it. Everything you need to know is at doyouwatchwhatiwatch.com, including our clapboard icon. If you click on that, it's a full printable list of what we are watching and recapping this season. Join us on our next episode as we chat about Hallmark's Holiday Mismatch, starring Carolyn Ray and Beth Broderick. Yes, those were the ants from Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And that's right, they are back together. All right, so here's the plot summary. When free-spirited Kath and uptight Barbara clash at a Christmas committee meeting, they are shocked to discover that they've accidentally set up their adult children via a dating app. Determined to stop the romance, the two mothers team up, only to realize that they have more in common than they thought. As their kids love blossoms, so does an unexpected friendship between their meddling moms, bringing both families together for a festive Christmas. Wow, that's long. Okay, we will have much to discuss, but until then... May your days be merry and bright. We will see you very soon. 